Well, this morning we're continuing in our series out of the book of Psalms. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm chapter 73 as we continue to talk about how to get through what you're going through. And I don't know where you are today. This was the absolute perfect worship service for my heart and truly connects to this worship service or to this message. I am so grateful for the choir and the orchestra and for Stephen. And Stephen knows when I'm up, if he puts my eternal king up, I'm very happy. So I'm, I'm very happy now. What a wonderful morning that we've had together. As we look today, we're going to be looking at an Old Testament character. His name is Asaph. And we're going to be looking, as we have in these last weeks, about common needs that we have and what do the psalmist say about them. If you remember following Easter, we talked about anxiety and how anxiety is an epidemic. It's an epidemic across the generations from our very youngest to our very oldest. Is something that even the city of University Park has asked the churches to focus on. We've talked about exhaustion. We talked last week in here, Pastor Jeff led us as we talked through maybe your favorite psalm, it's mine, Psalm 23, and apathy, and spiritual apathy. Today we're going to be looking at comparison. We're going to be looking at comparison. So if you have your Bibles open, look in verse 1. In verse 1, Asaph says this, surely God is good to Israel for those who are pure in heart. You know, he begins our message today with a confession of faith. Surely God is good. Now, I know some of you are reading out of the uh, ESV. It says there, truly God is good. Truly, surely, same thing. It's a word for emphasis. It was not a throwaway word. He is reminding us God is good. And on a day like today, we need to feel that in the very core of our being. Say that with me. God is good. Say it one more time. God is good. Feel that. But he gives a qualifier. He says to those who are pure in heart. Now in Psalm 24, we read that as a church several weeks ago. In Psalm chapter 24, the psalmist says that the pure in heart are those who do not bow to the idol or deal dishonestly. Now I'm looking at a fairly great group of people. I'm going to doubt there's a single one of you that's going home to a garden full of idols. I don't think that's a need within this church. But you know what? You've heard our pastor say it many times. The human heart is an idol-making factory. And what happens is we take the blessings of life, and what we'll do is we'll make them an idol. Because an idol is that which takes priority, that which takes center stage in your life. And for all of us, it could look like something very different. For some, it may be family, maybe your kids, your grandkids. You know, I was telling him in the first service, my grandson was in there, and I said, you know, we can settle debate about the cutest grand boy. I've got him. Now, he may be tied with yours, but there's nobody cuter. But we sometimes will make our family an idol, our career, our resume, the neighborhood that we live in, the car that we drive, what we achieve, our portfolio, how well we're doing. Whatever it is that has a priority in your life, if it's not the Lord, you have substituted an idol. The pure in heart. Jesus said it, blessed are the pure in heart. Well, what Jesus is saying there isn't that we're sinless. What he's saying is that the pure in heart are those who seek after the Lord. And those that seek after the Lord will find welling up in them, as you confessed a moment ago, God is good. God is good. But for the psalmist, it was a confession that was short-lived. Look with me in verses 2 and 3 as we begin our message. If you take notes, I hope you do. Our first point is this. Comparison exaggerates. Because all of a sudden, Asaph begins to look around. He begins to make a comparison about lives, and he finds himself wanting. Look in verse 2. He says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Well, what's he saying there? He's saying that his strength, his confidence that God is good, all of a sudden he began to waver. Why? He's looking at the wicked. Well, who's he looking at? He's looking at fellow Jews. He's looking at those that he says are not really following after the Lord. In fact, I know they're not, and they're doing better than me. And it caused him to waver in his faith. So who's this Asaph? Well, he ought to be spiritually a very mature man. He is a leader of worship. 
He's a contemporary of David. We know that King David was a wonderful musician. He was a a writer of hymns, of psalms. We've been reading those recently. Well, Asaph was the same. David knew him. And David put him in a very high position of leading worship in the tabernacle. He would lead the songs as they came in. In fact, there was a school of people that developed around him and followed him. The sons of Asaph, and you'll read later on in the book of Psalms, some psalms that are ascribed to the sons of Asaph. You might say across the centuries that Stephen now is a son of Asaph. He's a skilled leader of worship. Han O, a skilled leader of worship. That's what Asaph is. And yet here is this leader in the house of worship, and he's beginning to look around, and he's realizing, I'm not doing as well as some of the others. Now, think about this. This is a guy that does not have to worry about where his next meal is coming from. He runs in really high circles. He has a place to lay his head. He's respected. And yet with all that he's been given, all the blessing that has flowed into his life, he begins to compare his privileged life. And he goes, not so much. And he confesses uh, uh, confesses that he envies. In verse 3 he said, for I envied. Who's he envying? Those that he said are the wicked, those that are not following after God. You know, when Pastor Jeff said, Rodney, I want you to preach on this Sunday, and you'll be preaching out of Psalm 73, I ran for my Bible. And at some point in my time with this Bible, I wrote right here beside Psalm 73, envy is a dangerous matter of the heart. And Asaph is your prime example Asaph begins to envy. And what you see with Asaph is, from this wonderful confession that God is good, he begins to spiral downward. And he begins to compare himself to others. Now, it's attributed to Theodore Roosevelt that he said that comparison is the thief of joy. Now, I'm going to rephrase that a little bit and say that comparison is the thief of contentment. It's the thief of contentment. For Asaph, he is not content what he's been given. And this confession of the goodness of God is replaced by a confession of envy. He's looking around and he's going, I don't understand why they're doing so well. He's beginning to compare. And what we need to understand is comparison exaggerates. It exaggerates. Look with me in verse 4. In verse 4, he talks about they have no struggles. In other words, they're not suffering pain. He's talking about who? The ungodly. Sounds like he's a little disappointed there. He said their bodies are healthy and strong. He says in verse 5, they walk easily through life. In other words, they're free from the burdens of common to all of men. They're not plagued by human ills. In verse 6, he says, in their pride. Well, who's speaking of pride here? A very prideful man. He said the ungodly flaunt their superiority. Well, he's looking at his life and he's going, I think I'm the one that ought to be held in this esteem. In verse 7, he talks about the callousness of their hearts and out of their hearts flows iniquity. He talks about the arrogance that they have in verse 8 and that they threaten oppression. In verse 10, he says uh, that the world applauds the ungodly actions. Now, that's something you might think sometimes. You know, we are in a celebrity-soaked culture. You can't turn on the news. You can't turn on TV at night without seeing all of these entertainment magazines, and we just worship those that seem to have everything together. Well, my friends, let me tell you, none of us have it all together. None of us do. We live in an Instagram age where everything is supposed to be perfect, and we flaunt it, we post it. And we look and we say, why is it my life look like? Not knowing that just outside the picture frame, the house is a wreck. They may be on a perfect vacation, but the kids are screaming at each other. But he says they flaunt their superiority. He talks about how the world applauds. In verse 11, they mock God. In verse 12, they're carefree and they have an increasingly wealthy lifestyle. Verse 12. I'm telling you, when I first read this, I thought this is as contemporary in 2023 as it was when it was written thousands of years ago. And my friends, we live in the epicenter of comparison. We live in the epicenter of consumerism. And people will look around and they'll say, why haven't I got that? 
And they're embarrassed by what they have been blessed with. Well, what do I do? What do I do? We'll talk more about this in a moment. But what Asaph finds out is we seek the Lord. You know, there's a reason that in these days we've been asking all of us, all of us from the pastor all the way through the church to read together. So right now we're in the Psalms. If you haven't been doing that, you could start today. You don't have to catch up. Don't be an overachiever. Just start where we are. We're just past Psalm 73, so you can just catch up. You can download it off of our website. There might be some bookmarks still at the guest center out there. But join in reading it and making a daily discipline. And one of the things I told the first hour, I can give you the time to do it, and it won't take you additional time. Put your phone down. Put your phone down. You know, I just watch people. I watch families at dinner. If you go out, you've seen this. You may do it. Everybody pulls out their phone. Well, what are they doing? They're surfing through, not the news. They're going through Instagram. They're going through social media, many of them. So I can buy you a little bit of time. Just put your phone down and take a few moments and allow the Word of God to seep into your heart. You know, I I thought about this earlier. A few years ago, uh, we had a neighbor and uh, they moved. But they didn't sell their house. They kept it for years. I mean, more than three years. And they barely maintained it, but they they did maintain it. The grass got cut. Um, But all of a sudden, my lawn started looking really good. You know, because I began to look and go, mine looks better than theirs does. I forgot about the guy on the other side of me. Well, he finally sold the house, and this young couple came in, and I had a couple of kids, and we just loved them. But they were a couple of overachievers. And they came in, and with a year, I'm telling you, my lawn was a very poor second base. What do we do? We compare. We compare what we have to what others have, and we find ourselves wanting, and it can send us down. I've talked to people recently. That's the case. Well, what do I do about it? Well, the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4 He writes this, verse 11. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content. Now, what we need to understand is that contentment is not natural. It's not natural to the person who doesn't follow Christ, but it is not natural to the person who does. It's learned. If the Apostle Paul said, I had to learn this, then I have to learn it. You have to learn it. We have to learn to be content. He said, I've learned to be content in no matter what circumstance I find myself in. If you want to read about his circumstances, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 when you get home. I mean, he hadn't even lived to the end of his life yet, and he's been shipwrecked three times. He's been lashed. He's been beaten with rods. He has been stoned and left for dead. He has had a difficult life. And what does he say here? I've learned the secret to being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. He was hungry so many times. He was cold. He said, I've learned to be content, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's how. I've learned to do everything through him who gives me strength. If you want to know how to become content in your life, it's called you follow the Lord. You seek him, and you seek him in his word. And I'm telling you, culture and the world that we live in is going to continue to pull you It's going to pull you away from God. You've got to fight that upstream, and you've got to continue in relation to Him. You've got to be able to confess on a daily basis, surely God is good. Jesus says, where your heart is, there's your treasure. So where's your treasure today? If my treasure is any place beyond my faith, then I have a heart issue. I have a heart issue. You know, I've had the privilege of traveling in many areas of the world and doing missions work, and I've seen people who really had nothing. And what I've discovered, whether I was in Asia or the Caribbean or in Central America or other areas, that people who really physically have almost nothing, those Christians seem to be a lot happier than we are. I remember being in a home in the Caribbean, a little island, and this family took me to their home, neat as a pen, didn't have a lot. They were so filled with joy. I looked up at their ceiling and there was just large holes where you could see up into the sky. And I remember thinking, it's hurricane season. 
Not long after we left, a hurricane passed through. But they were content. And sometimes we allow that which we possess to own us in such a way that we lose the joy and we lose the blessing of what we do have. There was a Puritan writer, his name was Jeremiah Burroughs back in the 17th century, and he said this, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Now, I can make that a little bit shorter. Contentment comes from following Jesus. But when I look at what others have and what I don't, I exaggerate it. Secondly, comparison distorts. Look with me in verse 13 and verse 14. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been plagued. I've been punished every morning. Well, what's he saying? This man who is privileged more than most looks around and he says, is it even worth it? I've been following the Lord. Is it in vain? Again, it distorts that which God has called him to do, that which God has blessed him to do. And he says, it is even worth it following the Lord. And again, he continues in this downward spiral in his life. And that's what comparison will do. It will distort all of your reality and your perception and your perspective. They call it a midlife crisis for a reason. And what happens is we lose our center point and it distorts the goodness of God to us. In verse 14, he says, all day long I'm plagued, I'm punished every morning. Now, for those of us that suffer from health conditions, this might be a reference to personal health. He uses that word plagued. He talks about the morning being punished every morning. Maybe life is difficult for him in that res uh, respect. But guess what? He's still been talking about the lifestyle of the wicked. He's still been talking about their wealth. It appears there's another thing happening in his life. And what he says in verse 16, I've tried to understand all of this. And it's like he puts his head in his hands and says, I find it oppressive to me. I find it oppressive to me. I don't understand and what you see in this kind of shadow is what the pastor led us in last week. He just becomes apathetic. He looks to just give it up. In verse 15, he actually says that. But he said it would be a betrayal. And he's not willing to betray those that he has led. I might say his faith, but I'm not sure there. But he doesn't want to betray those that he led. He may not want to betray the king. And so he determines, it appears, to just mail it in. Kind of that quiet quit. I'll do what's necessary to get by, but that's going to be about it. Now, there are others that will take the opposite tact. While some will say, I'm done. Others will pour jet fuel on it, and all of a sudden, they begin to really begin to work to achieve that which they think that they're owed. And they both end up in the same place. They end up in apathy and exhaustion and, again, denying the very goodness of God in our lives. And exaggeration will lead to distortion when we allow ourselves to fall into the trap of comparison. So what does Asaph do? Asaph makes a wise choice. He makes a wise choice. He chooses to worship he chooses to worship. If you're taking notes, comparison may provide perspective. Now, I put that word may in there purposely. It's an auxiliary verb. In this instance, it means it may or it may not. And what he does here is he ends up entering into the house of the Lord. He ends up in worship in the sanctuary. That's what he says in verse 17. He says, it's oppressive to me till I entered into the sanctuary. Now, why is he in worship? Well, we don't know. Likely, it was because it was the expectation. That was the job. That was the job. You've all heard the old corny joke. It's a good Baptist joke about the guy who woke up on a Sunday morning and he's laying in bed. The alarm goes off and he just knocks it off and he thinks, I'm not going to church. I'm not doing it. Pulls the pillow over his head. His wife comes in and says, hey, I've got your breakfast ready. We need to get up. Time to get ready. Come eat. And he says, I'm not going he pulls the pillow down further. She said, you've got to go. He says, I'm not going. And she said, you're the pastor. You've got to go. That was a really bad joke. I wanted to wake you up right there. 
He may have been there because he was the worship leader. He may have chosen whatever happened. He allowed his heart to engage with the heart of God, and God did something in his life. And what he began to slowly discover is that which he had envied was not the true picture. It's not the true picture. You know, recently I had someone who's gone through some struggles. I've talked to a lot of people lately that are really struggling. And this individual looked at me, and they weren't being ugly. They just said, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through. And my response was, you're right. I don't. But God knows. You know, in the last couple of years, those two words have come up to mean a lot in my heart. God knows. God knows. And Asaph began to realize God knows. He opened his heart in worship. Now, this morning, all of you chose to walk into this sanctuary. It was a volitional choice. You could have gone to your connect group and gone home, but you chose to enter into worship. But you know what? Just walking in is not worship, but it's the first step. It's the first step. I'll never forget the first time I walked into this sanctuary. It was one of those <gasps> moments. But I didn't worship. I was being interviewed. It wasn't a moment of worship for me. But it's led to many, many, many moments of worship. And what we need to understand is that we have to sometimes, even when we don't feel like it, make the choice. Asaph honestly did not feel like. You can tell he's talking about feeling oppression. He did not feel like going to worship but he did. And in verse 17, he says, it's the hinge point till I entered into the sanctuary. And all of a sudden, his spiral down becomes a spiral upward, and he begins to make full circle right there. So what are we talking about here? I'm not talking about private worship. That's important. We talked about the importance of daily opening up Scripture. That's private worship. But there is something about being together now, I know this morning there are people watching online. I can name them by name, some of them. People who would love to be here with you. They're physically not able. And I want you to know you are loved. You are cherished. And we're grateful that you're here with us today. I know that there are people who check us out online, and we're glad that you're here. I talked to someone recently at an event. He said, I discovered you online during the pandemic. We're going to come. We're going to join. That's wonderful. But there is something about being together. If you looked at the order of worship today, there was something in there about being together, about gathering together to pray for our city. In the music that Stephen chose, there was just this sense of community that kind of bubbled over about being together. You know, the writer of Hebrews tells us that. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 24, 25, he says this, and let us consider how may we may spur one another onward towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. How do we do that? We do it in the fellowship of the church. Again, I'm grateful for online. But the experience is so much richer. I am spurred to worship when I'm with you. I remember a few years ago, I mean, this has been a number of years ago, I was seated over there, and there was someone that was singing with more enthusiasm than maybe anybody I've ever seen. I mean, they were into it, and they were really bad. I mean, they were more than bad. They were off key, they weren't, they, it was just bad. But you know what? It spurred me to worship. Part of it was self-preservation. I could sing as loud as them and it covered it up. But you know what? Just watching them and watching the joy on their face, it drew me into worship. We spur one another on. He says it spurs us on towards good deeds. You know, last week, Megan Hendricks was, Hendrickson was in here, and she spoke about her South Texas mission experience on the women's trip. You know, I've said this in here before, but I watched the national news. I saw the other night, again, the growing crisis at the border. I'm not as hard-hearted as some people say. I, I, I feel pity. I'm like you. I'll go, can't, can't they do something in Washington? What about these people? But you know what? If it wasn't for the church, my pity would end right there. I would do nothing. I know me. 
Now, many of you are, are much better than I am, but you might do something. I wouldn't. But because I am in this church, because I give through this church, I'm involved in the border. Because my wife and I choose to tithe, I am involved in the border. And we're seeking to make a difference as a church. It's because of this church and my love for John Parker and other men that I go down there at least once, if not twice a year. Why? Because I love the fellowship of the church as we go down and we seek to make a gospel difference. I'd never do that without the church. Never. The church will spur us forward. Megan was talking about Vacation Bible School. How many of you would say you trace your spiritual pilgrimage in one way or another to VBS? Raise your hand. There's a lot of us. Okay. How many of you went to VBS? Raise your hand. Okay. For about a third of you, it didn't mean anything. Okay. But for the two-thirds of us, boy, we got something out of it. I loved Vacation Bible School, my favorite week of the year. You know what? Vacation Bible School is going to be guiding children to learn about Jesus. And they might not trust Jesus this year, but one day they will. They may grow up to be men and women who are godly moms and dads, who go into our community and make a difference. You may be training up future deacons. You may have a future pastor of this church within your group. God help you if you do. I mean, the pastor's kids, I mean, they're tough. You invest in this church through your service, through your ministry, through your giving. You're truly touching the future. And we do it together within the fellowship of the body. If you're here today and you've not ever joined, this is the day. I've heard Jeff say it before. Quit dating the church. Now's the time to be engaged fully in what God's doing here. If you've never taken the opportunity to enter into the joy of giving, today ought to be the day. If you make a little, give a little. If you make a lot, give more. Give more. Why? It's going to do your heart good. Read what Scripture says. Read what Scripture says. I'm telling you, when I walk through the CLC and I see my grandkids running through there with such joy, and this is their church, it makes me grateful that Maria and I struggle to make a pledge commitment. There's something about investing your heart and your life and your talents and your giftedness and your resources through the local church that will impact your heart, but it it takes the church and allows the church to do all that God's calling us to do. And what Asaph discovered is within the fellowship of the church, through the worship that he began to experience, God moved in his heart. He gives a testimony in verse 21. In verse 21, he says, When my heart was grieved and my spirit was embittered, and my friend's comparison will make us bitter. It'll make us bitter. He says in verse 21, I was a senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. If you ever read the message, Eugene Peterson says there, I was a totally ignorant, dumb ox. And what you see here is that comparison leads to envy, which is a dangerous matter of the heart. But Asaph is rediscovering the goodness of God. Verse 25, he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? You know, think about that. This is a a passage to read at a time of loss. Whom am I in heaven but you? And you're enough. You're enough. He says in verse 26, and earth has nothing I desire but you. That word desire is a verb, and it means to delight in. And all of a sudden, he begins to find his delight, not in what he has, but in what he's been given by the Lord himself. And he finds his true identity, and his identity is not in what he can perform or do or what he has. He says it's in God. Verse 28, he closes and he says it this way. But as for me, it is good to be near God. It's good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds.